Hi there, Steve Coffin here, and today uh, I am going to talk about Chinese, learning Chinese. Uh, remember I said that uh, once a week I will uh, put out a video in a language other than English. So I'll have my two videos in English and one in another language. And uh, following, at least for the next little while, following the video in that language, I'll talk a little bit about learning that language. So today I'll talk a little bit about learning Chinese. Next week, I'll probably speak in French and I'll follow that up with a little bit about learning French. All right, uh, learning Chinese. I studied Chinese in 1968. I was with the Canadian government uh, Ministry of Trade and Commerce. Uh, Canada was about to recognize the People's Republic of China. Uh, I was uh, working for them. They sent me to Hong Kong to learn Mandarin. I couldn't go to the mainland because they were in the throes of the Cultural Revolution. I couldn't go to Taiwan because that would not have been acceptable. I had a choice. I could have gone to Monterey, California and had a great time surfing or go to Hong Kong and study Mandarin there. So I chose the latter and I have never regretted it. Um, the thing about Chinese, less so now than then, is that it strikes us if we are, say, speakers of uh, European languages as sort of very exotic. How can I learn a language that's from a culture that's so different from my own? And I would imagine that to some extent, people from different cultures, um, Asian cultures or others, <clears throat> may have the same attitude towards, le towards learning European or Middle Eastern or Central Asian languages, I don't know. But uh, one of my friends at that time said, you know, what if you can't learn Chinese? And at that point I had learned French. So I knew I could learn one other language and I felt pretty confident that, that I could learn another one. I, I guess what I have found through my Chinese learning is that Chinese culture, while it's fascinating and rich, and I was entirely unaware of it before I started studying Chinese, once you get into the language, it's not so inscrutable, it's not so strange, it becomes a part of you just like any other language that you learn. You enter that world, you enjoy it, you wallow in it, you discover it, you climb all over it. It's a very positive experience. Chinese has two outstanding difficulties and a number of things that make it easy. The two outstanding difficulties are the need to learn Chinese characters and the tones right up front. Those are the two big problems. After that, it's downhill. Uh, I recommend that you begin by, say, for the first month, and certainly that's what I did, I listened to simple dialogues and I relied on a romanized version of Chinese. So for the first month, I didn't do any characters. In those days, we used, we used Wade Giles, which actually I prefer to pinyin. But it's not a big deal either way. Uh, it seems that the world has standardized now on pinyin, which is the form of uh, romanization developed on the mainland. It has a few strange things like Q is pronounced ch and X is pronounced sh. It's a, sort of like a somewhere between an S and an SH sound. So you might meet someone who's give you their name card. I mean, I don't know why they do this. It means that if a Chinese person gives you their name card and their name is, you know, Quan or something, Q-U-A-N, you'll say, oh, Mr. Quan. Uh, I don't know why they've done that, but that's what they've done. So you have to get used to it. Uh, characters, so therefore after a month of pinyin, which allows you to get used to pinyin because it's very useful to have the pinyin and to learn some of the idiosyncrasies, tackle the characters. I've explained very often how I learned characters. I used to have these Chinese checkered exercise books and I'd have flashcards and I'd pick out the first flashcard of a character. I'd write it out 10 times, then put the meaning or the sound, the pronunciation of it, two or three columns over. And then I'd take the second card and write it out 10 or 20 times and continue doing that until I ran into the first card the pronunciation or the meaning again, then I wrote it out 10 times and then I put it across, you know, three or two or three columns further over. So it's a very basic kind of, um, call it spaced repetition system. Nowadays, there are many more modern, effective ways of learning characters. Uh, I got to the point, I started at learning 10 a day. I got up to 30 a day. 
with the understanding that you're going to forget two thirds of what you learned. So I had to keep on reshuffling the learned cards back into my deck because you have to learn and relearn, learn and relearn. Uh, it's like so much in language learning. At first, it seems impossible. I mean, the character for I, Wa, has like, I don't know how many strokes in it. You got to remember. I mean, it seems impossible, but it's amazing what the brain will eventually learn if you stay with it. And the big thing with learning characters is, it's true for all language learning, but especially for characters, do it every day. Every day, just, you know, that salami or bologna salami slice technique, if you just keep doing it, A, you won't slip back as much, you won't forget as much, and you'll eventually get there. And I use my technique for the first thousand characters, and thereafter, with enough reading, and, you know, when I encounter a new um, power, uh, character, you know, writing it out a few times, eventually they start to stick because you start to become more familiar with them. You, you know, it's like everything in language learning. The more things that you are now familiar with, the more things you notice. So you notice the components of the characters. When I first started and they, I was told that these are the radicals, these are the, the components that represent, you know, water or metal or something. It was meaningless to me. But after a while, you start to see those things. And, and so it becomes easier and easier to learn the characters. You just have to stay the course, all right? Uh, some people say, should you learn traditional or, or simplified? It depends where you're going to be, but at the very least, learn simplified. Uh, if you're going to be involved with mainland China, the vast majority of Chinese people in the world uh, use the simplified system. Uh, I started with the traditional and then moved to simplified, uh, which is actually an easy way to go because once you have the traditional, you can easily learn the simplified. It's kind of handy to have both. If you're in Taiwan or Hong Kong, you can pick up a newspaper, read it and understand it. The language itself, once you get past, okay, the tones here again, when you learn the language, every word that you learn in the dictionary or in the pinyin will have a tone mark. So the four tones are, if we use ma, 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 ma. So you have sort of a high flat tone. Ma, ma, which is actually starts a little lower. It's ma, ma, and ma. Now, depending how these uh, words show up together, some of those um, tones actually modify themselves a little bit. And so ultimately, you end up learning the tones as part of little phrases or little... Because again, one other thing in Chinese is a word, as we understand a word, like understand or uh, say improve, that's a good example, improve, or change, okay, so gai bian, gai is change, bian is also change, gai bian, gai shan is to improve, xiu gai is to uh, revise, so most of the words in Chinese are actually composed of two or three characters, and if you know one or two of the characters and you see how they're now connected with some other character, you can kind of intuitively figure out the meaning or at least the words are easier to remember. So the more characters you have, for every character you have, you actually potentially have three or four or five words because these now can be combined like building blocks with other characters to form two character or three character words or even phrases. So I digressed a bit from the tones. So after a while, you realize that you kind of have to learn the tones, not so much as individual, um, you know, characteristics of each single character, but rather as part of phrases, because that way you get into the intonation and because it's very difficult while speaking. Every time you go to use a word to try and remember this first tone, second tone, it's very difficult to do. But if you're used to certain phrases and a certain intonation of these phrases, you'll eventually start improving. And you don't want to be so tongue tied and hung up about the tones that you can't speak. So I, for example, found that my tones Improved over time, it was a constant battle. I might have been hitting them 40% at first and it just gradually moved up and maybe I'm now at 80% when I get excited and I want to emphasize something that's actually a third tone of wo, like yo meo, like do you have yo? I might say yo, because I'm keen to say something and then my inclination in English to put the tone where the emphasis is takes over and I no longer use the tone as in Chinese to indicate meaning. Remember that we have tones in English. There's nothing unique or difficult or strange about having tones. In English, we use tones. 
for emphasis in the sentence. But in Chinese, they use tones, ma, 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 to differentiate meaning. And so at times we have a tendency when we're speaking to want to use intonation for emphasis rather than for the meaning of the words. But you have to believe that you'll eventually get better at it and not get too hung up about it. In terms of the structure, the structure of Chinese, it's actually very rational. I think it's a very, you know, it, it, in its simplicity, it's a very efficient language. So you go, ni chu. Okay. I go, wo chu. Uh, you don't go, ni bu chu. And here, bu is actually fourth tone, but if it's bu chu, because the chu is a fourth tone, it becomes second tone. Don't worry about it, but it happens. Ni bu chu. Are you going? Ni chu bu chu. You go, not go. Uh, so, uh, you know, fairly straightforward stuff. Uh, in a, as in every language, you should uh, focus on learning the W words, why, where, when, etc. You know, like, why is wei shoma? And then because yin wei shoma, yin wei, wei shoma, yin wei. You learn some of these key connector words. Learn, I spent a lot of time in Chinese learning key phrases. You know, all of the things having to do with uh, why, because, uh, although, you know, Sweran uh, is although, Sweran Shama Shama is what? So Sweran Shama, Wahaiser, I still want to blah, blah, blah. Or even though, Jo Swan, da, 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 da. So there's a whole bunch of these patterns. The big thing for me in Chinese was patterns. And if I get a pattern, I want to find 10 examples of those patterns and then look for them in my listening and reading. All of the grammatical explanations that I found in Chinese grammar books, I can't remember a single word, a single term that they invent to describe Chinese grammar. All I focused on was patterns, particularly as uh, it regards the, uh, the, the question words, why, when, where, etc., and the connector words, you know, the although, uh, you know, um, however, and all those kinds of words. One little trick in Chinese that the, 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 they don't really have relative pronouns, so that uh, if instead of saying the house which is on the hill, they'll say the on the hill house. And there's a little connector word, the. And you got to get used to that. But by and large, the grammar is pretty straightforward. Vocabulary building, once you have characters, is pretty straightforward. Uh, this idea of sort of inscrutable, exotic, strange, you quickly get over that. Uh, I mean, that's there with any language, initially perhaps more so with the Chinese. But once you get into it, uh, it becomes your language. And uh, there's so much interesting stuff. Uh, when I studied Chinese, uh, we did a lot of reading of, uh, you know, Chairman Mao and that stuff because the Cultural Revolution was on. And so we got a real sense of uh, the whole political gang of four and stuff that was going on in China. But what was particularly fascinating, and I really recommend once your uh, Chinese improves, is the literature of the 20s and 30s. Because what happened to China is you had this, the, the uh, traditional China. Actually, it was a, a foreign dynasty, the Qing dynasty, which ruled China. And very traditional, with all of their traditional Confucianist and Buddhist and all of their traditional culture, somewhat isolationist if you want, all of a sudden, bang, runs smack dab into the Western world. And in 1911, there is what they call the sort of Xinhai uh, Gaming, the, the revolution. And there's a republic and then there's the struggles with warlords and all this kind of stuff. It is actually, it's quite astounding to me how quickly what we would call sort of modern, almost Western style intellectuals, thinkers, political thinkers, uh, novelists. And there was this outpouring of, of intellectual production in China through the 20s, 30s, despite the fact that there were, you know, warlords fighting and uh, basically a continuous civil war between the communists and the nationalists, invasion from Japan, they had, you know, foreign colonies, I mean, it was a mess, and hunger, and famines, and floods, and yet there was this outstanding intellectual outpouring, and that is some of the most interesting Chinese to read to me. I would also want to one day get back to my Chinese in order to read more about Chinese history, because there are so many stories from Chinese history, and Chinese people are very much aware of stories that come out of Chinese history from 2,000 years ago, and they make reference to this. And of course, 
I haven't had the time to spend on Chinese because I studied it 45 years ago and since then I've lived in Japan and I've learned other languages and, and really haven't spent enough time with Chinese. But all of that world awaits you, not to mention the modern Chinese. And this is one other thing I'll end up with and that is that when I studied Chinese, mainland China was kind of closed. It was, you know, Maoist China, people were afraid to talk to you. Whereas now you can go there, you can make friends, you can go to restaurants, to bars, uh, you know, it's modernizing, there's train stations, there are problems, there's corruption, pollution, and, and lack of democracy, and all those other things, but it's, it's alive, and, and the Chinese are very approachable. They're, they, they have their pluses and minuses, like every uh, national group, uh, their endearing qualities and their less endearing qualities when we're talking generalities, and uh, yet you find individuals with all kinds of different uh, personalities, but generally speaking, I say that they are quite... Um, uh, approachable, they love to talk, and if you speak their language, they're extremely supportive. So, there you have it, a brief uh, intro to Chinese, and I wish you all the best of luck in learning Chinese. Bye for now.